There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Okay, welcome to another Word in your attic. And we're delighted to welcome to this one Viv Groskop. Um, Viv uh, is a writer, comedian, and also the person behind the How to Own the, the Room podcast, which is, I think it's fair to say, it's about women and public speaking. Is that and a lot more, no doubt, Viv? Yeah, it is. I mean, it does what it says on the tin, How to Own the Room. And I have aimed it at women from the beginning. We interview mostly women trying to redress that balance you, you know where after god knows how many years and decades of talking about feminism <laughs> we still have so many horrible statistics around you know women not being able to do what they want and get where they want and so the podcast is really an attempt to try and get to grips with that and do something about it instead of just moaning about it all the time good good okay well look where, where we traditionally begin in these chats as you'll know is we start off by asking people if they can remember what record-playing machinery was in your home when you were a child, this being a sneaky way to find out about your home life, frankly. Can yeah. you remember that stuff? I do remember it very vividly, and I wish that I had the sort of mind that I would care what model of record player it would have been I, I do i can see oh, that's not important okay I see <laughs> it's the, the stuff word, being played on it yeah. yeah i see the word hitachi somewhere all oh, right okay like, fair enough that's where we were going in the early 70s in my in my house where i grew up in with my parents and my sister trudy who's three years younger than me it was just the two of us two siblings at home with my parents and um and where was that Which it was in, in bruton in somerset oh in right oh, right okay. and as I've sort of moaned in various things I've written over the years, um, there was a lot of dead time during, <laughs> during the 70s and the 80s in Somerset. Um, and I grew up, you know, dreaming of a life in London and a life where perhaps you would go and see live bands uh, and things like that. But there was, you know, no internet. Um, I was very excited about things like The Word, um, and, you know, the birth of MTV and all that stuff. So that was my window onto something more exciting. But we had a record player at home. Um, I think later on I had my own little turntable in my bedroom, but we had a main um, record player of some kind. I don't even know if we would have called it a music system. But that was... Um, where really we listened to my dad's records from from when. And I was what did older. what did he what have? Did he play? Well, like so, this is this I have to show you. This is like very typical. <laughs> this is typical of my dad's um, taste, and weirdly, this is all that remains. Pretty much, I've got a couple more things. All that remains of my so-called vinyl collection. So at some point, I would have had you know probably like two or three hundred vinyl records that I collected up until the age of about 18 and I had loads of Blondie I had loads of prints I had a lot of picture discs um, I had loads of amazing stuff but it's all gone and all that is left is the stars it's the stars <laughs> and I, I've got this um, that is funny I got this from my parents house in lockdown I went when I went to see them just after lockdown I was like I've like everybody I bought a turntable in lockdown for my birthday oh, really? as a treat you know, oh. thinking, oh, you know, I've got nothing else to do in yeah. lockdown. I'm going to, I'm going to rebuild my record collection. And so I have very slowly started buying vinyl on eBay to try and replace some of my stuff. But I went down to my parents and I thought, oh, they're going to have all my records. But no, they only had the stud. Just the um, stud. But it's I have li say, literally, they only had the stud. So yeah, literally, this is the one only record. only thing that they kept. And I don't, I mean, why? Yes, and the I point. love the, I love the graphic on this. It's just so fabulous. Um, but this is actually this has got some classics on it. Hot chocolate. Everyone's a winner. Um, Baccarat. Sorry, I'm a lady. Which you know I would have probably listened to this. So this is 1978. So I would have been five. And sorry, I'm a lady was the title music of one of my Edinburgh shows, which was called Say Sorry to the Lady. So clearly I 
thought of that when I was five. <laughs> uh, Roxy Music, Love is the Drug, which is still right. one of my favorite tracks of all time. Native New Yorker by Odyssey. Oh, uh, Odyssey made some great records. I mean, this is it, uh, 10 CC, I'm Not in Love, Rose Voice, Car Wash. You know, there's some great, this is actually a really, really great, a great. It's funny you should. It's funny you should uh, you should have that this week. I was only reading the other day. I don't know if you saw Johnny Gold died. Who was the man who started Tramp? Ooh. Tramp the the kind of smart St James's nightclub, where right. I think the stud is supposed to be based, isn't it? Yeah, it's a Jackie I Collins. It's a Jackie isn't Collins. It? Jackie Collins, yeah. Yeah, I looked at, uh, and there's it's got fantastic pull out this as well of like so you've got some Joan Collins. It is look. But she, Jackie Collins' novel, really isn't it? I Jackie think Jackie Collins wrote it. She wrote it and jo- her yeah. sister acted yeah. it. That's right, yeah. It's like, <laughs> sort of t- a, like sort of rubbish British version of, of um, Saturday Night Fever. Yes. Is that a fair, a fair but assessment? But with more, more sex in it, I think. That yeah. was the, the, the other element. But, you know, I was, I was five when this was a part of my life. <laughs> and I do look at it and think, especially look... This has got about Monsieur Le Stud for men. <laughs> Love that. And my dad at the time, um, he's, he was a sales rep for his whole life. He's retired now. Um, but he would, he would have been a sales rep then for Playtex, the bra, the bra company. Really? And that wow. was quite a short-lived part of his life. He later went into ceramics and giftware. But at this point, he was working for Playtex. So I think he thought this was pretty Hence cool. the stud. That's I'm absolutely. Kind of He's on brand. He's on stud. brand. Yeah. So can you remember uh, can you remember buying any the first the first singles you bought or anything? Yeah, unfortunately you them? these are, they're all lost now. But uh, okay, well, first, tell us about them. The first single I bought was Hey Mickey by Tony Basil. Oh, um, right. Which I'm guessing is 1980, 1981. So I would have been seven or eight. And that was around the time that I was really into the kids from fame and right. thinking that I kind of knew something about America because I owned a Tony Basil record and I had a cassette <laughs> of the kids from fame. So sophisticated. <laughs> so sophisticated, not just a brute and girl, you see. The world's going to be my oyster. <laughs> uh, that was one of the, f- and then I had a lot of really, really bad, embarrassing French records because I got really into French at school and I was doing that whole thing of thinking, you know, I'm better than this town. I'm going to have a bigger life than this town. I'm going to speak French. Uh, and so well, I'm trying I had, to think what they would have been. Is this I plastic things, Bertrand? No. I had, yeah, plastic Bertrand. I had a little Ça bit of that. I had um, Princess Stephanie of Monaco had <laughs> a one chart hit that was called uh, Comme un ouragan, like a, like a hurricane. And I got one of those, um, you know how the, the, European discs had a hole in the middle, yeah. So I had to fashion some kind of implement so that it would. I was saying onto they'd my turntable, yeah. So I, I used to yeah. listen to that on repeat until my parents just went crazy. I was really into the, um, I think it's 1983 Eurovision winner Sandra Kim, who was from Belgium. <laughs> I was really into loads of really embarrassing French. What music. did all your mates think about this? I mean, you listened to French records when they would have been um, listening to. I them. think I did it fairly privately because I was aware that it was a slightly pariah thing to do. <laughs> yeah. So I would pretend to be really into Spandau Ballet and Wham and Duran Duran, and of course I was. You and know, then sneak off to your room and listen to Plastic Bird. Yeah, but I would actually be listening to France Gall and Jean Jacques Goldman and uh, Jeanne Mas. Um, and I still I still listen to those uh, records now. And I, I love the fact that you can just get that on your phone, you know, because those records were so hard won for me. I'd have to wait yeah, until I went sure. to France to buy them. You know, there was no way that I could get that music over here. Um, so, yeah, I loved that. But I had I didn't I had a lot of pen friends. I was really into pen friends when I was a teenager. So I would write to my pen friends about this music. And sometimes we would send each other cassettes. Um, but I didn't have any. I didn't have any local friends who I could share my passion for French bands <laughs> like Gold. There was a French band called Gold. Gold. So if you like Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet, were you reading things like Smash Hits? Were you oh, reading? Any... Yeah, I loved Smash Hits. Oh great! Yeah. Well, what, what was on the cover around the time you were reading it? Oh, uh, it would. I would say it would be Lamal and Kajagoogoo. 
Um, oh, those right. would have been the pullouts for me. I remember them being obsessed with Five Star. Five right. Star was yeah. just on the cover all of the time. <laughs> I was quite into Five Star for a while. And the first concert I ever went to when I would have been about 12 or 13 was Aha. And that, so that was the Take On Me era. Where and, did you um, go and see them? Can you remember? Yeah, I went to the Hammersmith Odeon. Oh, so right. So you're all, all the way. Hammersmith Apollo. The Odeon, oh, yeah. Yeah. The Odeon. To my mind, it's the always the Odeon. Odeon. It always will be. And I don't care what they do with the name. Oh, yeah. So it's not, it's called the Apollo now, right? That's yeah. Like. Yeah. So the Hammersmith Odeon. And I went with about five or six mates from school and one of our long suffering mums who would have driven us up there from Somerset. And I remember we all thought it was really exciting because we could buy merchandise in an underpass. There, there was some kind of underpass on the way. Bootleg to the T-shirts. Yeah, and so, That's right. But we brought all these really horrible, like, hand-drawn pictures of Morton Harkett <laughs> that we thought were really cool. And we all, it was the first concert for all of us. And it was, it was really good, as I, as I remember. It was pretty amazing. But we all became obsessed with the fact that one of them, Morton, Mags or Powell, had looked at us. And we argued about this all the way home of, like, which which of us uh, had been looked at the most um, but I think about that I think about that and I think that's so interesting because that is a brilliant thing that rock stars and great on stage performers do is that they make people in the audience feel seen feel that they've been yeah, so picked out that's right exactly and so everybody you know they can't they probably haven't actually looked at anyone or maybe they try not to look at anyone um and I know from performing myself now that you know the lights are so bright you can't really see anything anyway um but to that quality of making people feel that you've witnessed them you've seen them that you were there together that's, that's something very special did yeah. you ever fill in a smash it's readers poll did you ever what, vote? Would I have sent that poll? off in the post? Yes. Yeah, I, you know, definitely. most fanciable male, best girl singer, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think I took that kind of thing quite seriously. Um, we also used to um, phone up the BBC using a payphone at school. This is when we were about 12 or 13. And uh, if we, I don't know how we would have found this out. Maybe it would have been in the Radio Times. If we found out that somebody who we like to like Duran Duran or Aha were going to be on the Wogan show. Yeah. We would phone up the BBC and make prank calls and say, you know, please, can you do a, um, can you make sure you do a, a tight shot on Morton Harkett's crotch? <laughs> and then we would put the phone down. <laughs> it's really, really childish. I'm so embarrassed when I think about that now. Yeah. Was <laughs> You're only human. <laughs> great, so great Morton, times. I'm Morton Harkett was your favourite. He was. Was, was he was one of the no posters on the wall, the bedroom wall? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, who else would I have had on the po as posters? I was quite a weird kid, so I I was really into music, and I've I, I have a really really broad eclectic taste of music. I, I've listened. I'll listen to anything and everything, and I've got three kids, so they're eleven, fifteen, and seventeen, and they have very eclectic music tastes. And so like one of my, my youngest one, who's 11, he's really into ACDC at the moment. And that's something I would have never listened to. But now I listen to it with, with him and I really, really like it. So I've always um, been really into lots of different things. But on my wall, I would have a picture of Morton Harkett next to a picture of Stalin, next to a picture of Brigitte Bardot. Um, because I was kind of, you know, like all teenagers, I sort of thought I was a bit political and that I wanted to be a communist. I didn't even know what that was. Um, I did go on to study Russian and I wanted to be a bit French. So I wasn't um, typically caught up in that whole image thing of bands in a way that a lot of my friends were. And I, I, re I remember very much looking down upon people who were really into the Smiths and the Cure which I think now is really sad because I the, I love the Smiths and the Cure. Why did you look down on That's really interesting. And um, because I thought it was too much of a fandom of, and it, it takes something away from, from you as an individual. And I was such an individual, right? Because I had a picture of Stalin on my wall. Don't forget. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yeah. um, but I, I thought it, it was too much for me, this whole thing of you have to be really into this band and hate everyone else. Yeah. So if you like the Smiths and the Cure, you're not allowed to like Duran Duran. I thought that was kind of stupid. And also right. you have to wear the same clothes as them. 
you know you have to have a white face and black eyeliner and yeah you know, black. and I I really I didn't like that and I and I felt I could see that despite my own you know stupid teenageness which is just normal I could see that real trap you know that lots of music fans fall into of thinking this is going to help me find my identity and be an individual but actually you just join another group of sheep <laughs> right it's, it's so true there's a wonderful film about iron maiden where they're interviewing a load of iron maiden fans and they're you know what marks out iron maiden fans they say we're individuals and they're all, <laughs> they're all absolutely, absolutely, absolutely to a man or woman wearing absolutely the same clothes yeah and uh, it doesn't strike them at all it's an extraordinary thing were you ever in a band um no I really, really wish I had been, and I am a really violently keen karaoke singer. But violently, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I have to be kept away from the karaoke. <laughs> what are your main karaoke tunes? <laughs> main karaoke tunes would be very cliched, like "I I Will Survive," um, possibly an overly ambitious Celine Dion number. Yeah. Or, something like you know queen of the night from the bodyguard super classy we're talking classy here <laughs> or i do like a duet of i know him so well with my sister that'd be up there yeah um sorry i was gonna say i was a groupie i was a big groupie of really terrible bands so right, which bands right. are you following around which which ones which ones? so when i was about 16 or 17 um, I really want to remember the I can't remember the name of this band, but there was this band who they didn't nothing ever came of them. They're from Devon, which was quite glamorous to me being from Somerset. <laughs> and they would come and play our local pubs. And I would facilitate facilitate some of this because I worked as a barmaid in a local pub in Bruton in the Blue Ball, which is sadly no more. It's no longer a pub. Um, and I would help them get gigs and then I would go and hang out with them at their gigs. And I thought I was very, very cool doing this. And then when I was at university and I spent a lot of time um, in Russia because I was studying Russian, I was a major groupie of uh, a Russian, uh, Ukrainian band, a Russian Ukrainian band called Kolny Hatch, who believed that they were named after the place where the UK's first mental asylum was founded. Just very near where yeah. I live now. Which I think is actually true, um, but I don't know how it, they it, found it, out a about Fun time it. party band. Uh, they, they they were Ukraine answer to Red Hot Chili Pepper. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and that was a big part of my life for about three years, and I was going out with um, the lead guitarist. Um, so the group was called Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch. It's brilliant. Coney Hatch. Russian accent is brilliant. Yeah, Coney Hatch. That's and they had all of their lyrics were in English. So they were very keen. This was this was we're talking 1991, 1992 here. Um, that, yeah. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers would have been massive, although a lot of people in Russia hadn't necessarily heard of them. So they thought what this band was doing was really original <laughs> and they wrote all their lyrics in English, but they didn't really speak English. So they were very excited for me to become part of their entourage because I could check all of their lyrics and translate to them what they had actually written and they they had probably their best song was um i'm not drunk is only fucking funk that was probably their best song um but they had so many crazy Again, lost in translation crazy crazy <laughs> lyrics um one of the lyrics is i will always remember it's i have got bell bottom trousers i walk through pimply mouthers I'll translate that in a minute. They look at me. They talk about me. They suck their stinking croziers. So right. I'm sorry. Go on, get... sorry can what... you write that down for me? So the, it's this. I've got bell bottom trousers. I walk through pimply mouthers. So p a pimply mouther is um, like a teenager with lots of spots who's like can't stop talking. Yeah. A pimply mouther. They look at me, they talk about me, they suck their stinking croziers. <laughs> oh my God. What is a crozier? <laughs> it's what it's it's I want to know. <laughs> I mean, it's not yeah. going to get on the radio, whatever it is. So I had, yeah, I had, well, I had a lot of really funny um, 
interactions with Russian promoters and managers who were trying to use me as a conduit to get them into the UK. I sent their cassettes to A and R people. I tried, but they, you know, they were never going to go anywhere. No, no, no. Bless them, Corny. So, what, so uh, what about your first? So, what was your first time on stage then, yourself? If you weren't with a band, when yeah, was your first time um, performing in your own right? I, I did a lot of theatre at school and I had very vague ideas that I would like to do something on stage, but it didn't seem at all realistic. And I also wanted to write. So I kind of thought maybe writing is a bit more realistic. So I always had it in my mind from when I was about sort of early teens that I would probably be a writer. But I also had it in the back of my mind that there's something else that you're not doing here, but you don't know how to do that. So forget about it. (laughs) And at university, I did do theatre and comedy, um, but not very seriously. I didn't think that it would lead to anything, but I did do, I did a bit of Footlights. I did a Footlights show, which Stephen Fry came back and hosted. That was amazing at the Cambridge Corn Exchange. Um, That was incredible. And I did a few like relatively okay kind of plays over the course of the four years I was at university and then I I think I just realized that I wasn't really as ambitious or as confident as a lot of the people who are going after that kind of work I mean this would have been that I would I would have seen Sasha Baron Cohen on stage when I was at university Um, I would have been faintly aware possibly of somebody like David Mitchell Um, it's about it's around about that era of the early 90s and I just thought, you know, you're not in that league, so don't even go there. And but what made you start to do stand up though? Because you did, I mean, you've written that fantastic book about, about yeah, it was really to anyone yeah, so, who hasn't done stand up, it seems utterly, utterly terrifying. It was really my regret once I was in my mid 30s. So, yeah, in the early 90s, um, I was at university doing all of that and feeling quite intimidated by it. Then the mid 90s, I went into journalism and I worked on Esquire and Cosmopolitan and The Telegraph. Um, and then I went into as a freelancer, I started working for The Guardian and The Observer. So I was doing all of that. And I really I you know I love writing and I'm, a, I'm probably a natural writer. So that was all good for about 15 years. And then when I hit my mid thirties, I just had this real moment of just thinking, God, you're a fake. <laughs> like you haven't done what you wanted to do with your life. Like, what, if, what are you doing? Uh, and I think that was partly because I'd had my children by then. And I really, I think you have to face up to certain things when you have children about who you really are. And so I started, I started performing stand up, and I didn't do it particularly seriously in the beginning. I just did it really to, so I could kind of look myself in the eye to know that I'd done it. Were there but, any stand-ups that you'd watched and nicked ideas from, and, you know, just analyse the way they did it? Um, I, I've always analysed, and I continue to analyse, actually, Joan Rivers, because I think she's a really, really interesting example of a woman who really owns the room. You know, she is totally uncompromising and makes everybody get on board with her ideas. And if you don't like it, get lost. You know, if you don't like it, switch off. There's there's no compromise in what she does at all. And I think she was incredibly ballsy. Uh, Loads of her stuff is kind of redundant now because it would be seen as incredibly politically incorrect. And, you know, I I think she'll sort of cease to be talked about, at least for some time, because um, it would be seen as very unfashionable the way, especially because she was very bitchy. And it's no longer really acceptable, I think, um, sometimes. I mean, Catherine Ryan gets away with it, um, but she was really bitchy. (laughs) And and that's not so acceptable now. But yeah, I love studying her and how she holds an audience, how she manages to move through ideas really, really swiftly, how she hits a punchline. She's got incredible discipline in what she does. That wonderful way she put people down by just saying, oh, grow up. Just yeah. a great way to kind of deal yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. there was always this famous story of, I think she had a joke about somebody being blind and it was a really kind of tasteless, awful joke. And somebody in the audience shouted out like, how dare you, I'm blind. And she just like totally went for him and said, yes. oh, boo hoo, who ah, cares? Yes. <laughs> One day you're going to die. Are you going to cry about that too? Um, and I don't think anybody would... would um, 
get away with that. No now. further yeah. heckling. Yeah. 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 And so I, I it, see, it, yeah, yeah, go on. Okay, when, when you started doing it, the thing that always intrigues me is, did you did you have disastrous experiences that oh, you yeah, still terrible, call upon? Terrible, so and terrible. How do you sleep after those <laughs> yeah. kind of um, things? The thought yeah, I always think. Well, I remember when I, in my early career as a journalist, I had worked on the Daily Express. There's a whole story to be told there. Yeah, <laughs> but luckily yeah. it was a, short, a short-lived one. Um, and one of my colleagues was Peter Hitchens. Um, he's a All columnist right. on the Mail on Sunday now. And I had kept in touch with him because we had both um, have an interest in Russia. And I remember bumping into him when I was started to do stand up. So this would be about 10 years ago. And I said, he said, oh, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm doing this stand up thing and I'm doing 100 gigs and 100 nights, consecutive nights to try and like figure out, is this really for me? What progress can I make um, to give myself a bit of a a process of getting through it. I think you need to have process to get through the early days of stand-up. And I started telling him about some of these gigs I was doing. And he said, oh my God, Viv, those sound like the kind of places that suck out a piece of your soul and keep it there forever. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that is pretty much yeah. what it's like. <laughs> um, so yeah, the I think I, I lived it too hard sometimes I definitely took it too much to heart and I took it too personally and it's one of the reasons that I love doing this work around how to own the room and trying to demystify this whole process of being public being in the spotlight having moments of pressure when other people are looking at you where it doesn't matter whether you're being a stand-up or you're in a job interview um, those kind of moments of massive cringe we don't need to live them as hard as we do. Um, but yeah, when I first started it, oh uh, yeah, I mean, I just... So was that moment of just, just you know, just a bad reaction, nobody laughing? Was it people heckling? Yeah, it, it... it's, I think when you're not, when you're new and you have, it's it's quite, it's, it's very deceptive stand up because you can have a very, very good gig. You could have a run of really good gigs that are like beginner's luck or you just got into a room where the conditions were right or you're just having a really good day or there's a good fit between you and the audience. There's a lot of unspoken chemistry that you can't really predict or, or do very much about. And so you get this idea in your head of like, oh, I can do this. This is OK. And then you'll hit a gig where you can't do it and the chemistry is not there but you don't have any tools in your arsenal to change that. So later on you learn the tools and, and you turn it around. So, you know, really great stand-ups who've been doing it for years, their level of a bad gig is, is going to be pretty high because they've attained that consistency that comes with having those tools. Right. And also but, they can engineer jokes out of the yeah, audience's non-reaction and all that. Exactly. So yeah. you have those tools, but early on you don't have them. And so you kind of have to suck up your own failure. And the worst thing is, t is tumbleweed. You know, having, having people heckle you or... I don't think I ever early on had any... I mean, I know um, I did stuff early on hosting Joe Brand's book tour. And so I talked to her a lot ab about all of this because I was always trying to talk to more experienced people and say, like, how do I shortcut this? How do I shortcut the pain? And they were all a bit like, yeah. well, you can't. You just have to go through it. Um, but I know in her early days, um, and there would have been far fewer women on the circuit then, you know, people would just shout, get off, get off your fat cow. And yeah, that yeah. became like part of her routine was like anticipating all of that and turning it around. But it, nowadays you don't get that so much. You get more random heckles um, or you get silence. You, you get a sort of overly respectful silence and that is much worse than being heckled. But, <laughs> one, but once you've been doing it for like a year or two oh, years, you, you're not going to get that anymore because you'll know what to do. Overly respectful silence. I like that. It's so well put. Yeah. I, can, I can really imagine. Yeah, and you're like, I'll screw so your overly respectful silence. Like, <laughs> yeah. there's hostility. Come on. Oh, dear. No, it's, it fascinates me. So with your How to Own the Room and, and you, you've written a book, so-called, and so forth. Uh, and what you're, one of the things you're trying to do is just is give people some tools that they can fall back on. Is that the case? Yes, that's definitely one part of it. Another part of it is really opening up that conversation and asking people who look as if they really know what they're doing and they've never had a moment's doubt in their lives <laughs> to reveal the truth. 
And so when we started the podcast, we had Mary Portas, Nigella Lawson, Professor Mary Beard, who went on to have Hillary Clinton, Margaret Atwood, um, loads of different women from all different walks of life. Some women who really are in the spotlight all the time, others who are more behind the scenes, maybe women who like the CEO of a board. We've just done Indra Nui, who was the CEO of PepsiCo. Um, for 12 years who was an incredibly powerful woman full of presence it's getting those kind of people to talk about how they learn to do what they do and showing people that it is a learned skill because yeah. I think you know it's true of music it's true of comedy it's true of any kind of public speaking that you're not just born with it and I think so many people think you know you're either born with charisma and you can just do this naturally yeah. Or you can I think that's so true. With anything I've ever done that people think say is quite good, I always think the same thing. You have no idea how hard I've worked at that. You really have no concept. <laughs> uh, you, know, pre, you, know, you know, because I know how much preparation has to go into absolutely anything. You know, it's ten thousand hours. It's whatever, isn't it? The people. Yeah, speech of mine particularly interests me. People, people stand up at their children's weddings to make speeches, having not prepared anything, and you're thinking, "My God, yeah. an experienced person wouldn't do that, <laughs> would they?" I can, I can remember they? you, Dave, doing a thing at the Oxford uh, Union Debating Society. I think with Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran was on the same bill. Yes, it was. The idea that if you're a pop star, you kind of think, I don't need to prepare because I'm Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran. So everyone's going to be thinking, this is fantastic. Nick Rhodes is talking to us, you know. And uh, your your great mantra, and and you're so right, Dave, is, is that if you, if somebody wants you to speak for kind of four minutes, it's it's an hour and a half preparation. If they want you to speak for an hour and a half, start now. It's just, yeah. it's just so much thought goes into looking effortless and spontaneous. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, yeah, the same thing. Same thing applies to loads of things. So, Viv, what, what other records have you got there? Have you got anything so, else today? Yeah, <laughs> I bought um, from my pathetic collection. Uh, this is, this uh, is reacquired recently. Okay, eBay yes. Purchase. This was a big part of my childhood. Um, yeah, my dad was into the stars and, you know, 70s disco. My mum was really into ABBA. But they did have some taste. So... Right. Uh, this is obviously, you know, Mrs. Robinson. It's one of my favourites. Feeling groovy, sound of silence. Um, I love, I love this album, and it just never dates. And right. my dad always used to say, he, I don't want to overstate this, um, but he, I think I interpreted this in my head more than he actually claimed it. But I interpreted in my head that he was close friends with Paul Simon. He wasn't. But uh, he used to, he, my, my great, my grandparents used to run a shop in Chesham Boys uh, in Amersham in Buckinghamshire. And near there, maybe it was in Windsor or somewhere like that. Apparently there was some kind of jazz club or some kind of club where Paul Simon used to do sort of secret, small, early gigs before he was Paul Simon. Well, and, he, he probably did. Yeah. And my dad used to go to these gigs and I was always incredibly impressed um, at that. Uh, I thought this was very cool. So I always... So did he claim to, to have met him then? No, I don't think he did. No, no. There, there in was your a lot head, of, you just imagined. There was a lot of focus instead on the fact that... Because uh, my grandparents had, had this shop, Cheshire Boys Stores. And it's not far from Great Missenden, which is where, where Roald Dahl uh, lived. And so there was a lot of focus on the fact that Roald Dahl bought all of his chocolate at my grandparents store and i've since discovered that apparently every local shopkeeper within a 50 mile radius oh, the same thing. Yeah. has the same claim so there is some you know dubious nature to the claims uh, yeah, of my yeah. family um but i would look at this album and think oh that's my dad's friend <laughs> right. when I was a that's child. Lovely. um <laughs> from my teenage years um i've got this Voice of the Beaver. Oh, the voice oh, of the yes. Beaver. Yeah. Wow. And this was absolutely and probably my fate one of my favorite albums when I was a teenager. Um trying to look at the date. Yeah, 1988. So I would have been 15. And right. this and Transvision Vamp were just the best thing in the world. 
I was at a wedding at the weekend actually and they played I Don't Care Transmission Ramp and I was the only person dancing to it I'm going to say it's, I don't feel this? that Transmission Vamp are still alive as a concept. I hope they are. Is I there a big following still? I love Transmission Like Transmission Vamp are like a, you know, in the way that the stud is like a rubbish British, British Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> Transmission Vamp are like a rubbish British blondie, blondie yeah. which is actually better. Yeah. I think. Anyway, so didn't, yeah. Didn't Elvis Costello write? He wrote, a whole he wrote an album. album for her in, in a day or something, didn't he? Something I'll write mad an entire album in a day, and she recorded wow. it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Wendy James. Did. Yeah, Wendy yes. James. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. I, 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 the DJ at the wedding must have been a very, uh, a very kind of uh, brave soul to design. <laughs> I know no, I'll play next. I'll play <laughs> Transvision Band. Yeah, it was that. I think that was swiftly followed by Dizzy. The Wonder Stuff. Oh, right. oh, yes. And Shiny Happy People. It was all around in that direction. And oh, the other right. thing I brought as well. Now, this is, I don't know whether to save this for my, like, best album. Oh, well, we got your go thing. Should I? No, I'm going to bring it in on, and I'll choose so, something else. Okay, all right. This go would on. be this a sarcastic great... choice. This go. album, I can't believe that I have reacquired it, that it physically exists as an entity. Alongside the stud... This was the sound of the late 70s, the sound of my childhood. And it stars on 45. Oh, oh my goodness. Do you know about this? We do. Oh, Very good controversial. God, do we when we were at Smash Hits, it. we ran a little feature where we went out in the, in the street with copies of stars on 45 and invited members of the public to destroy them in imaginative ways because we hated it so much. But I can yeah. imagine it would have been really exciting if you were you know, mid-teens or whatever. Well, I was, I was sort of, yeah, five, six, seven years old when, Sorry, this, this, yeah, when this was in our house. Yeah. And I heard the Beatles on this. Through that. Oh, absolutely. Before oh, yes. I heard the real Beatles. So I was very surprised when I heard the real Beatles. Because uh, this all is covers, isn't it? It's cover bands. Yeah, it is all yeah. done at the same tempo. So it's not. It, actually... It's all done at the same yeah. tempo. Yeah, it, it starts all... with okay. it starts with no reply, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes, it does. It does no reply. Then which I'll is an absolutely brilliant song. Um, it starts in a really unexpected way. Yeah. The thing I... it was it, it they it was so successful, and I was I was going to say it's slightly later than you said. It's early eighties, surely, isn't it? Stars and 45 was oh, 1984. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was 1980, 81. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. And so Mark and I were both working in the Smashers office, was in Carnaby Street, above a shop that literally played that record and only that record all the live long day. Oh, and it drove us completely. Oh. Wow. I can well, still remember it happened once before. And then you got yeah. that kind of oh, driving me. Your door. That's right. There and it's all. <laughs> I loved I loved this. But I was slightly, I, I had it in my mind for years. And every time I hear a Beatles song, I, I do this version of it. Because oh, yeah. this feels like the real version to me. Come yeah. on, Beatles. This is the real version. <laughs> yes. um, Speed up, Beatles. Get with it, guys. I, I acquired this in lockdown. I bought it. I bought it on eBay. I listened to it. I was horrified. It's so terrible. It's <laughs> it is. Terrible. They're quite interesting songs, aren't they? Do you want to know a on. secret? Drive my car. I mean, they're not just the. They're not just the singles. You know. And there's nowhere, man. Just sort of yeah. comes, comes in out of nowhere. It's I funny mean, how many people we've talked to on these podcasts who've talked about that, haven't they, Davis? That was how they discovered the Beatles, as, yeah, as, as yeah, did you did. Yeah. Really interesting. So how much did it cost you to get that nowadays via <laughs> email? Fair, I unfortunately, I'm not just talking about it. I own it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it cost me like nine ninety nine, something like that. Oh, that's more than it would have cost back yeah. in the day. Yeah, it was an investment I was happy to make until I listened to it again. <laughs> also because it, it's... Side A is about 25 minutes long and it's just one continuous track, which is very, very weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, they did very well out of it. Where did they come from, Mark? They were Dutch. They from, D- Dutch, they were Dutch. Yeah, yeah, they made a fortune. They must they have made an absolute fortune. Crazy. It was just they had that moment in the sun, didn't they? About three or four. <laughs> 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 Love it. So is is that your greatest record ever made? Um, 
No, it can't. Got another one. It's it a good can't, choice. Can it? I don't have um, another one with me, so I'm going to choose my next future purchase for my my vinyl for, reacquisition. From your past. Yeah, yes. which is this is really personal for me, rather than me saying, "Oh, this is the great." You know, I'm not a music journalist, so I don't have any qualms about you know about this um i'm going i want to choose like a prayer by madonna the album right, okay. oh, right. um because that i listened to when i was about 14 or 15 and i just listened to it on repeat and it's got some really weird um weird songs on it like dear jesse that no, nobody ever talks about that, <laughs> that um and the title track like a prayer i think is a just a fantastic one of madonna's best tracks and it just captures, for me, a really great album. It captures a moment in your life. And I think that one of the reasons that we associate music so closely with teenagehood is that it's about that cementing of your identity and who you are and who you want to be. And you're never quite, uh, this is perhaps gonna sound a bit depressing, but you're never quite as alive as you are that is really depressing isn't it in that time no that's true all, yeah, true. all those moments true. Yeah. we have to accept it so that was a moment in my life when I think I finally realized oh I'm not going to have to live with my parents for my entire life I am going to get out right. of here I'm going to have my own life <laughs> and oh yeah what well, I would have been like 14 15 16 and I just used to listen to that all the time and and also it uh, the record sleeve was infused with patchouli I don't know how they did this. How oh, they used to do that. It smelt. So there's yeah. a smell associated um, with it for me as well. <laughs> but it's impossible. Well, I think it's impossible to find to, to, you know, re recent records that you feel as strongly about and have an, as close an emotional attachment to as the ones you listened to when you were a kid. It's just, yeah, it's just exactly. Impossible. Yeah. Really? And it's also that, that sort of vinyl thing of listening yeah. to the whole side yeah. and listening to the whole other side and listening to it as a whole experience yeah. yeah that you just don't have anymore with this kind of playlist approach to things no, you know no. playlist is great. You, you get your you, 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 know, you, your maybe, you may begin it you you may begin it yourself by reassembling your teenage record collection slowly one at a time i think that's a really good idea i think you should you should have a room in your house where you can go and it can be your teenage bedroom and you can kind of revisit it. And you've got five records and a modern Harkett poster. Yes. That would be absolutely perfect. <laughs> That's what you Living need. And uh, that's what you need. Jaffa cakes as well in the corner. You know? <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe it's I'll been on pens to yeah, write, it, get, write to your pen pal. I'll get a little freezer in there and I keep Vionettas in it. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Viv, has been lovely talking to you. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.